there's no results. They have to take their affairs into their own hands. They're going to have to fight back. So they began launching these primitive projectiles and missiles to an area called Sedirut. And then with the inaccuracies of these missiles, a couple of Zionists or a few Zionists were killed. Remember, the people who are dying in Gaza, either through the policies of this starvation scheme that the Israeli government has, or through the raids using the helicopter gunships and using warplanes on the civilians in the Gaza area, are probably a factor of 100 to 1. Every time 100 Palestinians are killed, there's one Israeli who is killed. And even though that's the case, you just open up your newspaper here in this area, the Los Angeles Times. First of all, can you realize the disparity in the percentage between the Palestinians who are killed and the Israelis who are killed? That will never, never come through. And then, when you put a million and a half people in Gaza through the tortuous and the life-threatening policies that they have been going through, have the Israelis been going through these types of life-threatening policies? So the Palestinians erupt and they bring down that wall. It's reported that President Reagan told Gorbachev to tear down that wall. None dare tell the Israelis, tear down that wall. And that wall makes you think for a moment, what type of Israelis are we looking at? Look, we are people who interact with each other, who should speak to e each other, who should exchange ideas and thoughts with each other. A wall doesn't help that process. A wall, what are you going to do? You're going to wall off your whole country? You put a wall in that particular area, and now that that wall collapsed because of the economic and social pressure that put the Palestinians at a point of going under existentially, now you say you're thinking about extending that wall the whole 225 kilometers between you and the Egyptians there in that particular area. Is this the right way to think? Are we going to live in a world of walls? It's not only that little wall that was brought down and it's only the beginning of things to come. You've been working on a barrier that extends for over 400 miles in the West Bank. That's a mega wall. What are you going to achieve by walling yourself into a ghetto? This is not life. Were you, did you feel the freedom when you came out of the ghettos? Now you want to go back to slavery in, within your own man-made ghetto on a larger scale. Where are you? Can't you think of what you are doing to your own selves? This is a hand of concern that is extended 
for your survival into the future. Let's be brutally frank about this. How many are these Zionists who are occupying the Holy Land? Let's give you the, the, the figure of six million. You're not that many, but we're gonna tip the math to your advantage. Six million of you are there. You are dead center in an ocean of two billion Muslims. You wanna build a wall? in that ocean of two billion Muslims and you think you're going to survive the course of the future within that cage? If you think like that, I only can feel sorry for you. You don't understand human nature, you don't understand the forces of history, and you don't understand what you're doing to yourselves. And to bolster this imagery, you checker the West Bank with 600 checkpoints, military patrols that are at the intersection of roads and junctions. 600 of them. Aren't you sick and tired? of stopping miserable Palestinians and asking them in a tortuous manner, where is your ID card? Where did you come from? Where are you going to? Who do you have there? Who's with you? And on, aren't you sick and tired of that lifestyle? Because whether you know it or not, those checkpoints are recruiting a new generation of competence against Zionism. You want us to be silent about this? It's enough that most of this world has been bought into a financial silence that you are responsible for. And you think you're going to suffocate the conscience and the word of truth? It cannot be done. You launched a war. Let us remind you, memories sometimes are hard on some people. You launched a war in the summer of 2006 on the people of Lebanon. That war didn't go well, did it? It didn't live up to your expectations. You thought that within a matter of days or at most a few weeks, you will have finished off every form of resistance to you in Lebanon. And you gave it all you had, short of dropping nuclear weapons. You gave it all you had, and what happened? You didn't defeat the Islamic resisting force in Lebanon. For the first time, you yourselves tasted what it is like to be defeated. The Winograd Report substantiates this. The resignations in that government and in that military hierarchy substantiates this. And you think that because you have nuclear weapons that you're going to be able to defend yourselves? Where are you going to drop those nuclear weapons? On Lebanon? On Syria, Jordan, or Egypt? It's like dropping it on your own selves. 
But the way your thoughts have been coming out, you might be as irrational as to do that. And so what do you want to do? You want to kill us and kill you at the same time? Fine. Six million or 20 million of us go and four or six million of you go if you use those nuclear weapons. And the issue is solved. There's still tens and hundreds of millions of people around the Holy 